We have now arrived at the decade of 1910 in our history, and the most notable world event during this decade was the Great World War. Eventually, this war would be called World War I, but initially it was simply called the Great War. So how did it start? Recall that Austria-Hungary had recently annexed the area of Bosnia and Herzegovina, down here, uh, and the people in Serbia were angry about that. And so there was this person who was Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who was the heir to the Austrian throne. Here, so he's the heir to the Austrian throne, and he makes a trip to visit Sarajevo. So he goes down and Sarajevo's in this newly annexed area. So the heir to the Austrian throne makes a trip to visit Sarajevo, and while he's there, actually it was June 28th, 1914, he was assassinated by a terrorist from Serbia. And so Austria-Hungary was looking for an excuse to invade Serbia, and because the terrorist was from Serbia, Austria-Hungary blamed Serbia for the attack. And Austria-Hungary gave Serbia an unrealistic ultimatum, and then when Serbia was unable to meet the ultimatum, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. Now, recall uh, that at this point time in history, countries in Europe were forming alliances with each other. So Serbia was actually had an alliance with Russia, and we've already talked about the fact that Austria-Hungary had an alliance with Germany. And so these alliances pulled Germany and Russia into the war, and Germany declared war on Russia. Now, also recall that the conventional military wisdom at the time was that the best way to win a war was to have a decisive, preemptive strike. And so military leaders in Germany believed that if they ever found themselves in a war with Russia, it would leave them vulnerable to an attack by France over here. If they defended this border, that would leave this other border vulnerable. And recall, there were tensions between Germany and France. And so because of this, Germany established a plan that, in the event of war with Russia, they would first do a preemptive strike on France. The idea is that Russia was a big country, and it would take Russian troops a long time to get to the German border. This meant that in theory, the German army would have enough time to first come down here and do this preemptive strike on France and then swing around up to the German border over there and then defend the, their, their German border with, between Germany and Russia, defend that border against Russian troops. So Germany enacted their plan to make a preemptive strike on France, uh, which required going through Belgium. So they had to go through Belgium to get to France to make that preemptive strike. And, uh, and so then they asked Belgium for, for permission to march their army through Belgium, and Belgium declined. And when Belgium refused to cooperate to allow the German army to march through the country, Germany declared war on Belgium. And the United Kingdom uh, was allied with France um, and Russia and also with Belgium. And so the United Kingdom was allied with France and Belgium, and it had financial interests in Belgium ports. So therefore, the United Kingdom declared war on uh, Germany. And then we have the Ottoman Empire down here, and they were worried about, about events, decided their best uh, approach was to make an alliance with Germany. And so they wanted to maintain their power by maintaining an alliance with Germany, which meant that they were now at war with the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom uh, decided to make a preemptive strike on the Ottoman Empire. And that was the start of the Great War. One characteristic of the Great War is that it was a war of trenches. As Germany invaded France and began to march towards Paris, the armies from France and Britain were able to stop the German advance. And then both sides began digging long, narrow trenches in the ground that soldiers could stand in for protection from gunfire. They created miles and miles of trenches. Soldiers essentially lived in these trenches, which were muddy and filthy. Then, when soldiers on either side attempted to rise out of their trench and attack the other side, they were usually killed with machine guns. <laughs> 
So the, the war reached a kind of stalemate where both sides were dug into their trenches and neither side could advance. And the Great War was also a war involving new deadly weapons. There were U-boats, which were German submarines that could fire torpedoes and sink ships at sea. There were machine guns, and there were tanks, and eventually the development of poison gas. Now, initially, most people in the United States took an isolationist attitude. People were horrified by Germany's invasion of Belgium and France, but they mostly wanted to stay out of the war. However, this became more and more difficult over time. Part of the reason for this is that in an effort to blockade England, German submarines or U-boats were attacking United States merchant ships that were carrying supplies from the United States to England. And then in 1915, German submarines attacked a passenger ship the Lusitania, and the Lusitania was traveling from the United States to England. A German submarines shot torpedoes at it, and the ship sank in 18 minutes. There were about 2,000 passengers on board that ship, and about 60% were unable to get to lifeboats, and they drowned. And this included 123 Americans who died when the Lusitania sank. So, Finally, in 1917, the United States entered the war, and this was one year before the war would finally end. So what were the consequences of World War I? Well, Germany lost the war, and the Treaty of Versailles required Germany to pay a huge amount of money as reparations. This created economic hardship in Germany, and many people in Germany viewed this as a national humiliation. Eventually, this would be the source of tension leading to World War II. And in Russia, recall that Tsar Nicholas Romanov was already unpopular before the war, and then with the Great War, Russia suffered further economic hardship and tragic military losses. As a result, a civil war broke out in Russia, and Tsar Nicholas Romanov was overthrown, and his entire family was first imprisoned in a house in a remote area, and then the entire family was killed. On the screen, you see a picture of the Romanov family. There's Tsar Nicholas and his wife and their four daughters and their son, and there's also a picture of the house where they were killed. So this civil war in Russia led to the Bolsheviks taking control of Russia. And the Bolsheviks were influenced by Karl Marx, and they were led by Vladimir Lenin. And they formed what would eventually be called the communist government in Russia. The Great War also had substantial consequences for the Middle East. Recall that Britain was at war with the Ottoman Empire. And as part of their strategy for defeating the Ottoman Empire, Britain tried to stir up revolution. And they, re they recruited the inhabitants of the Middle East to revolt against the Ottoman Empire. A man named Thomas Edward Lawrence was initially an archaeologist, but then he became an officer in the British Army, and he became a key person that traveled throughout the Middle East, attempting to stir up an Arab revolt in the area. He has since become known as Lawrence of Arabia. What happened, though, is that Britain ended up making three mutually exclusive promises to different groups of people. First, they promised the inhabitants of the Middle East that, if they helped overthrow the Ottoman Empire, they would gain self-rule after the war. Second, at this time in history, Jewish people were scattered throughout the Western world and they often suffered severe anti-Semitic persecution, especially in Russia. And Britain realized that it could gain an advantage in the war if it could harness Jewish support, both at home and abroad. So to gain the support, they promised leaders of a Zionist Jewish movement that, if Britain won the war, Jewish people would be allowed to settle in the area of Palestine. 
And then the third promise is that Britain made plans with France that, after winning the war, land in the Middle East would be divided between their two countries. So what happened is this. After the war, the promise of self-rule was largely ignored, and land was divided between Britain, which took Palestine and Iraq, and France, which took Syria. And the map on the screen shows how the land was divided. In addition, Britain allowed large-scale immigration of Jewish people to Palestine. So taken together, this created unrest because people were denied self-rule, and it led to future confrontations and violence between the inhabitants of Palestine and the new Jewish immigrants. Back in the United States, there were several important cultural developments that took place during the decade of 1910. It is during this decade that the women's suffrage movement begins to gain momentum. Women are becoming more and more vocal in demanding the right to vote. In 1913, there is a huge march in Washington, D.C. supporting the women's suffrage movement. The pictures on the screen are pictures from this march. It is also during the decade of 1910 that a racist movie called Birth of a Nation is produced. Scenes from this film are depicted on the screen. This was a silent film set in the time of Reconstruction after the Civil War in the United States. This film falsely depicted Reconstruction as a time when black people had power and when black people were terrorizing white people. It depicted black people as being corrupt and as seeking black supremacy. In this film, there was a black male rapist who was played by a white actor wearing blackface, and this rapist pursued a white woman into the woods, and she leaps to her death. Then the victim's brother organizes the Ku Klux Klan to regain control of Southern society. This racist film was incredibly popular. The film became the highest grossing film for 20 years. It also revitalized the Ku Klux Klan. Notably, at the time, Woodrow Wilson was president, and he screened the film in the White House. And his reaction after seeing the film was this. He said, My only regret is that it is all so terribly true. Note that Woodrow Wilson was actually a very highly academic president. In fact, before becoming president of the United States, he was president of Princeton. However, Wilson also grew up in the South, and he was probably more overtly racist than other presidents of the time. For example, when he became president, he took steps to increase segregation between workers in the federal government. And he also fired many black people who were supervisors before he became president. So taken together, this provides further example of how racism thrived in entertainment, in academics, and in politics. Another form of racism that became popular during this decade of 1910 involved eugenics. This is the time when a eugenics movement begins to grow and becomes quite popular in the United States. And one of the key people in this eugenics movement was a man named Charles Davenport. And he got a large grant from the widow of a wealthy railroad tycoon, and he founded the Eugenics Record Office at Coal Spring Harbor in New York. On the screen are pictures of Davenport and his Eugenics Records Office. Now, Davenport was a biologist, and he was another Harvard alum, and he was also a Harvard professor, and he wrote books that promoted eugenics. And the Eugenics Record Office had a team of field workers that collected a vast amount of data on people. 
Their goal was to contribute to research that would support eugenics, and so they collected data from large samples of people regarding anything they thought could be inherited, any types of inherited traits they wanted to assess. So for example, they collected data on physical characteristics, achievements, skills, professions, education, personality, mental problems, disease, alcohol use, and relationships. Now, the data they collected were often based on subjective impressions from unstructured interviews, and their profiles were sometimes created solely based on gossip or family recollections. So this was a huge investment to produce a massive data set that was mostly, at least in scientific terms, mostly worthless. But this gave momentum to the eugenics movement. Also, in 1916, a New York lawyer named Madison Grant published a book that promoted eugenics, and the book was titled The Passing of the Great Race. And the book proposed the idea of Nordic superiority, and it became quite popular. So Grant argued that there were different European races, and he called them the Nordics, the Alpines, and the Mediterraneans. On the screen is a picture of Grant and a figure from his book showing where these races were supposedly located in different parts of Europe. And Grant claimed that the United States had been established by the superior Nordic race. However, Grant was concerned because large numbers of recent immigrants to the United States were coming from what he considered to be the inferior Alpine and Mediterranean races. He was also concerned because he calculated that the Nordics in the United States were not producing babies at a sufficiently fast rate. So he argued that unless something is done to stop the current trend, the superior Nordic race will disappear and the United States will become populated by these inferior races. Now, in 1918, Davenport and Grant together, they form a highly exclusive pro-eugenics organization called the Galton Society. And recall that Francis Galton was a psychologist who started eugenics, so they were naming it after Galton. And their plan was to study what they called racial anthropology. And membership of their club was given only to people who met the following qualification. They had to be, quote, Native Americans who are anthropologically, socially, and politically sound. Now, notably, they use the word native to refer to white people born in the United States and not the inhabitants of the continent before white people arrived. And membership was usually limited to just about 25 men in their organization, and one key member was a psychologist, uh, the psychologist Robert Yerkes. If you recall, we talked about Robert Yerkes before. Robert Yerkes is the person who wrote the article introducing Pavlov to psychologists in the United States. And as we will see shortly, Yerkes will become a key figure in the intelligence testing movement that will soon dominate psychology in the United States. So there continues to be a strong tie between eugenics and psychology. One example of the influence of the eugenics movement is that the United States began passing sterilization laws. These laws specified that people could be sterilized against their will to prevent them from having babies if they were judged to have some defect that made them inferior. Here on the screen is an example of a form that was used to order an involuntary sterilization. So it says uh, the board finds that the said inmate and then the person filling out the form is supposed to circle one of these options, insane, idiotic, imbecile, feeble-minded, or epileptic. And by the laws of heredity is the probable potential parent of socially inadequate offsprings likewise afflicted, that the said inmate may be sexually sterilized without determinant to his general health, and that the welfare of the inmate and society will be improved by such sterilization. And so if a physician signs this form, the person will be sterilized within 30 days after the form was thought signed. And notably, many of these sterilization laws remained in place until the 1960s. 
Now I want to go back to England and introduce to you someone who will become a rising star in the story of statistics. Specifically depicted on the screen is Ronald Fisher. So Fisher grew up in England and apparently Fisher was severely nearsighted. As a child, doctors told him not to read using artificial light. So at one point, a mathematics tutor taught him in the evenings without using pencil and paper. As a result, Fisher learned to do math in his head without writing things down on paper. This was both an impressive accomplishment, but also something that made it difficult for Fisher to communicate his mathematical ideas to other people. That is, because he did so much of his work in his head without writing things down, people often failed, to, they often failed to understand what he was doing. Also, Fisher had somewhat of a reputation for being impatient with people who failed to grasp his ideas. My impression is that people often found Fisher to be someone who was kind of easily annoyed and difficult to understand. So anyway, Fisher, he grew up in England and then he entered a Cambridge in 1909 and he studied math and he was a top mathematical student and even as an undergraduate, he published a geometry paper. And while Fisher was a student, he met William Gossett. Now recall that Gossett, he was that person working at the Guinness Brew Brewery uh, Company. Uh, he developed those formulas for a T distribution that researchers could use to estimate the amount of sampling error in studies. And so anyway, after meeting Gossett, Fisher sends Gossett a paper providing a complex, math uh, a complex mathematical proof for Gossett's T distribution. And although this was an impressive mathematical work, I imagine Fisher came across as a little bit arrogant, kind of like, you know, hey, I just thought I'd send you this proof I developed to show you what you're doing. So Fisher, though, eventually he, uh, he graduates, he receives his master's degree. And after that, he actually did not pursue any further education. And he actually didn't have any prospects for an academic job. I kind of wonder if some of the situation might have been related to the fact that he was someone who was easily annoyed and often difficult to understand. So a few years after graduating, though, uh, Fisher uh, writes a paper and he sends this paper to Carl Pearson with hopes of having it published in Biometrica. Recall that Pearson is the editor of the new journal he started with Galton uh, called Biometrica, the new statistics journal. And so Fisher's paper provides a formula for calculating the error distribution of Pearson's correlation formula. Uh, what's that mean? So essentially, the, uh, what, what Fisher did is he took Gossett's ideas about sampling error and applied it to Pearson's formula for the correlation. Now, the key thing for our story here is that when Pearson got it, he really didn't understand Fisher's paper. And he was also skeptical that Fisher's formula actually worked. And so Pearson held Fisher's paper and then he delayed publication for about a year. And then Pearson finally published Fisher's work, but he published it in the form of a footnote for a larger project. So this denied Fisher the deserved recognition for his work. And it made Fisher very angry. And it started a long term feud between between Pearson and Fisher. Uh, so, for example, although Biometrica was the most prestigious statistics journal, and although Fisher would soon become possibly the most important statistician for psychology, Fisher never again sent a paper to Biometrica. So as we will follow Fisher, we will see that he makes one of the most substantial contributions to data analysis in psychological research. And like many other people we've been discussing, he was also strongly in favor of eugenics. Now, up to this point, psychologists have not yet agreed upon a clear definition about what exactly psychology is. Many psychologists were interested in questions of human consciousness, but psychologists were exploring a range of different topics. Also, most of the ideas that psychologists were exploring in the United States were ideas that were imported from Europe. 
As we've seen, two of the biggest influences were Wilhelm Wundt in Germany and Francis Galton in England. But now, in the decade of 1910, a new, distinctively American psychology will emerge in the United States. This new, distinctively American psychology will be focused on two key areas. One is behaviorism, and the other is intelligence testing. So, let's take a look at the birth of these two movements in the United States. So, behaviorism is an approach to psychology that was essentially founded by John Watson. Recall that, where we left him last, John Watson was doing research with animals, and he had recently moved to, to uh, John Hopkins University, and he inherited the editorship of the journal Psychological Review. Now, at this time, there were many young psychology students who were becoming frustrated with the extent to which the discipline of psychology was focusing on trying to understand conscious experience. Titchener's introspection did not seem to be producing any useful results, and it was becoming clear that it was very difficult to assess conscious experience, and studies of conscious experience tended to, to um, they tended to uh, produce results that were nearly impossible to validate. And of course, from Watson's point of view, well, Watson was doing research with animals, and so theories of conscious experience were of little use to him. So, Watson comes up with a plan for a new type of psychology that will put an end to research on conscious experience. And recall that Watson had inherited the editorship of Psychological Review, that prestigious psychology journal. This was the most prestigious journal, uh, psychology journal in the United States, and Watson was the editor, and he could print anything he wanted in that journal. So, in 1913, Watson publishes a paper in Psychological Review that has been called his Behaviorist Manifesto. In this paper, he outlines his plan for a new type of psychology called behaviorism. He describes how this new behaviorism is to be an objective experimental type of science focused on the prediction and control of behavior. In this new behaviorism, there is no introspection, no consciousness, no division between human and animal. According to Watson, both structuralism and, functional, and functionalism, they both have failed because they both focused on trying to understand conscious experience. And they're both based on assertions about conscious experience over which many people disagree. Let's take a look at an excerpt uh, from John Watson's Behaviorist Manifesto. So I have an excerpt of his Behaviorist Manifesto on the screen there. So he says, psychology as the behaviorist views it is a purely objective experimental branch of natural science. Its, its theoretical goal is the prediction and control of behavior. Introspection forms no essential part of its methods, nor is the scientific value of its data dependent upon the readiness with which they lend themselves to interpretation in terms of consciousness. The behaviorist, in his efforts to get a unitary scheme of animal response, recognizes no dividing line between man and brute. The behavior of man, with all of its refinements and complexity, forms only a part of the behaviorist's total scheme of investigation. So that's John Watson's Behaviorist Manifesto and the start of behaviorism. One thing that is interesting about John Watson's behaviorism is that initially he wanted to include the study of cognition or thinking as part of his behaviorism. And he thought that he could include thinking as part of behaviorism 
because he thought that thinking or cognition might simply be a type of subvocal speech. And if cognition was simply subvocal speech, it would thereby make it an observable behavior. And in 1915, John Watson was elected to be the president of the American Psychological Association. And for his inaugural address, he planned to discuss work that he was doing where he was attempting to demonstrate that thinking is indeed subvocal speech. He was trying to do research where he would detect slight small vocal cord movements that occurred when people were thinking. However, as you might guess, he was never able to detect any vocal cord movements that line up with his theory, and this line of research failed. And so the date for his inaugural address was getting closer and closer, and at the last minute he needed to switch plans and find something, something to present for his inaugural address. And so he decided to switch and give a speech on Pavlov. Now, actually, prior to this point, John Watson really hadn't expressed a whole lot of interest in Pavlov. But for his inaugural address, he gives a speech on Pavlov and classical conditioning, and this then makes Pavlov and classical conditioning part of the behaviorist research agenda. Another interesting thing about John Watson's research is that in 1916, Watson began research with babies. Now, this was actually before psychologists developed ethical standards about informed consent. And at this time, Watson's research lab was in the same building as the John Hopkins Medical School Hospital. And so whenever Watson needed some babies for his research, he could simply ask some nurses to bring him some newborn babies from the hospital nursery. And in this way, Watson did research with babies, and he did research on reflexes and emotional expression in babies. For example, he determined that babies express emotions of fear, rage, and love. And the picture on the screen shows Watson testing the grasping reflex in a baby. Now, on one hand, this line of, this line of investigation on reflexes and emotions might not seem consistent with Watson's behaviorism. Especially if the goal of psychology is to study behavior, why is Watson studying emotion? On the other hand, I suspect that he would say that he was investigating behavioral expression of emotion and not the internal experience of emotion. Still, these are not topics that we would associate with the later type of behaviorism as it eventually developed. But anyway, in 1919, Watson publishes a book that's titled Psychology from the Standpoint of a Behaviorist, and this provided further argument for his behaviorist approach. Now, the way that history of psychology is typically told, John Watson's behaviorism is often described as something that is opposed to Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic theory. And eventually, behaviorism and psychoanalysis will become like two opposing theories. Eventually, people supporting these two approaches will come to view each other almost like enemies. And eventually, Watson will entirely denounce Freud. However, if we look closely at what Watson is doing in the decade of 1910, it will become evident that he was actually influenced by Freud. He actually drew from Freud to develop his ideas that he would test using his behaviorist approach. And the evidence for, uh, the evidence for this uh, comes from some historical research conducted by Mark Rilling, who was actually one of my professors when I was in graduate school. So let's take a look at evidence suggesting that Watson was actually influenced by Sigmund Freud. Now, to provide some background, recall that Watson had a rather traumatic childhood. He had a lifelong fear of the dark, and he often experienced fears and anxieties. So he might have been especially interested in understanding the causes of his fears and anxieties. And if so, for this reason, he might have been especially interested in Freud's ideas about how childhood experiences can influence adult fears. So, the first thing to note here is that at Johns Hopkins University, Watson was involved in the medical school. 
He taught courses to medical students, and he interacted with psychiatrists who were medical doctors at the medical school. And note that Freud's ideas at this time were especially popular among psychiatrists. So Watson would have been associating with people that liked Freud's ideas. And in this context, it would have been natural to have conversations about Freud. And along this line, we actually have a copy of a letter that Watson wrote at this time to a psychiatrist, uh, to a psychiatrist friend. It was a letter he wrote in 1912. And in this letter, Watson stated that he had been doing research with normal subjects using, quote, Freud's and Jung's method. Now, it's not clear what Watson meant by Freud's and Jung's method. Uh, Maybe he was doing some kind of word association. Uh, Maybe it was some kind of study of dreams. I'm not sure what he was doing. But whatever he was doing, this letter implies that he was viewing Freud with a favorable light as the source for his idea for the method he was using. Also, another thing, around this time in history, many authors were writing articles in popular magazines in which they described Freud's ideas for the general public. This is something that was making Freud popular and accessible for all people in the United States. And in 1916, John Watson wrote one of those articles. He wrote an article about Sigmund Freud making Freud popular for the general public. Uh, He wrote, it was an article in a magazine, and the title of the article was The Psychology of Wish Fulfillment. And in this article, he explained Freud's dream theory in terms of habit. And recall that William James talked about the importance of habits. So essentially, Watson was using a concept from William James to explain Freud. I'll read you just a short excerpt from this article. So Watson writes, The reason dreams appear illogical is due to the fact that if the wish were to be expressed in its logical form, it would not square with our everyday habits of thought and action. We should be disinclined to admit even to ourselves that we have such dreams. Immediately upon waking, only so much of the dream is remembered, that is, put into ordinary speech, as will square with our life at the time. The dream is censored, in other words. So again, the key thing to note here is that Watson seems to hold a somewhat favorable view of Freud. He's explaining, Fro- he's explaining Freud to the general public. And here's another thing. In 1917, Watson publishes an academic article on transference. That's Freud's concept of transference. So in this article, Watson considers Freud's idea that uh, that a child's or a client's sexual desires can be transferred onto a therapist. And Watson broadened the concept of transference and suggested that maybe fear could be transferred from one stimulus to another. So what he's doing here is that he's taking this Freudian concept of transference and he's applying it to his behaviorist interest in stimulus and response. And the key thing to note is that at this point, Watson is citing Freud's theory of transference as the source for his idea. And one more thing, uh, around another, uh, uh, have, we have another letter that Watson wrote around this time. And in this letter, Watson stated that, uh, quote, the central truth that Freud has given us is that habits from childhood can influence adult functioning. Again, he writes, quote, the central truth that Freud has given us is that habits from childhood can influence adult functioning. Again, this fits with the possibility that Watson was especially interested in Freud's ideas about how childhood experiences can adult can explain or can explain adult fears, because Watson had a lot of fears himself. And again, he's actually using James' habit theory to explain Freud. And most importantly, by using the phrase central truth when talking about Freud, it implies Watson has a positive view of Freud. Now, I don't want to overstate the case here, so it's important to clarify that Watson clearly never fully endorsed Freud's theory, and he did not see value in the concept of a subconscious, and he did not like the dogmatic style of orthodox psychoanalysis. So he never fully endorsed Freud. Yet, the thing to note is that At this point, Watson is citing Freud as the source for his ideas. 
And this brings us to a famous study that Watson conducted at the end of the decade of 1910. Specifically, it brings us to the study that Watson conducted with his research assistant, Rosalie Reiner, called the Little Albert Study. The study is frequently described in introductory psychology textbooks, and the way the study is described is almost always wrong. So what is this study? So the Little Albert Study was conducted using a single nine-month-old baby boy named Albert B. And Watson put little Albert on a mattress along with a white rat, and he let Albert explore the rat. And initially, Albert seemed curious, and he demonstrated no fear of the rat. The picture on the screen is from the little Albert study, and it looks like it's a picture of Albert playing with the rat. So then, Watson began a process where he would clang an iron bar behind Albert's head, making a loud noise, every time the boy reached for the rat. The noise made Albert cry. Then after, re then, then after repeated trials, where Watson clanged the bar every time Albert reached for the rat, eventually Albert became afraid of the rat. And according to Watson's reported results, Albert's fear of the rat eventually generalized to other furry things, such as a rabbit, a dog, cotton balls, and a Santa Claus mask. Here are some other pictures from the Little Albert study. And the problem with how the study is usually described is that it is usually described as a study where Watson was testing classical conditioning. And this is probably consistent with how Watson eventually came to understand the study himself. However, the study was not actually testing classical conditioning. Because in classical conditioning, the subject is a passive learner. For example, in experiments with dogs, a buzzer may be paired with food, and these two stimuli would be presented together regardless of what the dog does. In contrast, the little Albert study, in that study, Watson clanged the bar whenever Albert reached for the rat. The clanging bar was contingent on Albert's behavior. And the appropriate psychological term for this is punishment. So Watson was punishing Albert for reaching for the rat. And punishment is not part of classical conditioning. Now, another problem in describing this as a study of classical conditioning is that Watson's original idea for the study appears to have come from Sigmund Freud and not from anything Pavlov did. Watson was testing the idea that fear could be transferred from one stimulus to another, and as we were just talking about, this idea was an idea that Watson originally attributed to Sigmund Freud. Now, there are a couple other important problems to point out regarding this study. Uh, first, it was a study with just a single child. Uh, recall that we were talking about William Gossett and how Gossett developed formulas for a T distribution, which can be used to determine the amount of sampling error in a study based on the number of participants. And this could be used to determine how many people are needed in a study to produce results that reflect something meaningful in a population. Now, if Gossett's T distribution was applied to Watson's study with just a single child, it would show that Watson needed a larger sample to produce meaningful results. Accordingly, it turns out that other researchers have been unable to replicate the Little Albert study. No one else can consistently get results where a baby's fear generalizes to other furry objects using the methods described by Watson. Watson had a study with just one child, and it wasn't big enough to produce meaningful results that could be replicated. And then another big problem with the study is that it was simply unethical. Watson was attempting to create a lasting fear in a child, and, as it turned out, Albert's mother removed him from the, from the study and moved before Watson took any steps to remove the child's fear. 
He did not use any safeguards to try to make sure that the child would not be harmed by the study. So, in summary, the famous Little Albert study, the study that's supposed to be about classical conditioning, was not really about classical conditioning, and it was a study that no one since has been able to replicate, and it was a study that was unethical to conduct in the first place. And so, in addition to Watson's behaviorism, intelligence testing was the other major movement born during the decade of 1910 that became part of a distinctively American psychology. And there are three men that played key roles in the story of intelligence testing. One of them is Robert Yerkes. Recall that Yerkes is the person that published that paper about Pavlov, and he was a member of that newly formed Galton Society Club that promoted eugenics. The other two people are Henry Goddard and Lewis Terman. And as I tell the story of intelligence testing and the intelligence testing movement, there are two things that will become apparent. First, this is a movement driven by racism and eugenics. Second, this is a movement that made psychology popular. It made psychology a popular academic discipline in the United States. Let's start our story of the intelligence testing movement with Henry Goddard. So Goddard received his PhD in psychology from Clark University, where he studied with Stanley Hall. And recall that Hall was a strong supporter of eugenics. And Goddard was also especially interested, interested in Francis Galton's work. And recall that Galton was the founder of eugenics. So then uh, Goddard graduated in 1906, and Goddard got a position at a place called the New Jersey Home for Feeble-Minded Children in Vineland, New Jersey. Notably, at this point in history, terms such as feeble-minded or moron or retarded were considered uh, academic terms, and academic people often use these terms. So Goddard worked at the New Jersey Home for Feeble-Minded Children in Vineland, and after he'd been working there for a few years, he went on a trip to Europe, and he acquired a copy of Binet's new intelligence test. Recall that Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon had recently developed their test for identifying children in the Paris schools with learning difficulties. So Goddard got a copy of Binet's test, and he translated it into English. And here's an example of what that test looked like. So we have this page here, and on the left-hand side, there's a column that says Schedule of Tests, which is a list of questions that are administered to a child. And then on the right-hand side, it says Apparatus, which are objects that are needed in order to administer the test. And then it's broken down into what they call mental ages, and there's a list of tasks that a child is supposed to be able to do at each mental age. So here we have the mental age of three years old, mental age of four years old, mental age five years old, and there's a mental age six down there. And I've put some of these things on the left-hand side here so you can see them a little easier to see what they are. So a child with a mental age of three years old should be able to point to nose, eyes, and mouth, should be able to repeat, it rains, I'm hungry, should be able to see pictures and objects. And over here, there's a list of different pictures the person's supposed to have to show the child and the child should recognize what's in those pictures. And then for a mental age of four, the child should be able to recognize what is a key, a knife, and a penny. Should be able to repeat one, four, eight, and so forth. A mental age of five years old should be able to copy a square, should be able to repeat his name is John, he is a very good boy, and so forth. So that's what Goddard's interpretation of the Binet test looked like. Here is another example of an item from Goddard's translation of the Binet intelligence test. So for each pair of faces, children were asked to identify which face is prettier. Now, as we're looking at these items from Goddard's intelligence test, it might raise the question, how is intelligence defined? How is Goddard defining intelligence? How is intelligence being defined in this new intelligence testing movement? And this is always an important question in psychology because psychology is a discipline that studies constructs and not physical things. A physical thing is something you could point to and say, there it is. 
A construct is something that needs to be defined. So whether a psychologist wants to study intelligence or pain or depression or self-esteem or anything else, it's important to keep in mind that these are all constructs. They are not physical things and they all need to be defined before they can be studied. Without a definition, you cannot measure them. You cannot weigh them, hold them, or see them. But once I define what I mean by depression, or define what I mean by pain, or define what I mean by intelligence, well then I can measure these constructs and then I can study them. But it's important to keep in mind the fact that research needs to begin with defining the constructs. And if the construct definitions are bad, the research will be bad. So the question, how is intelligence defined? That's a very important question. Now, one very common definition for intelligence, a definition, uh, one that's actually still used today quite a bit, is that intelligence is, and I have it on the screen here, intelligence is a capacity to acquire and apply knowledge. Now, this definition has a couple major problems. First, it's not really possible to measure a person's capacity. So, for example, you could measure how quickly someone solves a puzzle, but this doesn't tell you about the person's capacity to solve puzzles quickly. Because no matter how fast the person solves a puzzle, there's always a possibility that a person might have the capacity to solve puzzles even faster. Also, it's not possible to measure a person's capacity to solve a puzzle without also measuring that person's experience and training and familiarity or achievement in solving puzzles. Also, another problem with this definition involves the term knowledge because the term knowledge is actually very vague. Different cultures have different types of knowledge that may be valued and it would be impossible to define knowledge in a way that's not culturally biased. The question on the screen asks, which face is prettier? And it certainly is easy, easy to see how this question reflects a particular cultural perspective about what types of knowledge people need to acquire. So defining intelligence as a capacity to acquire and apply knowledge is a particularly dangerous definition. And one reason why that's a particularly dangerous is that it lends itself to racist interpretations. Because the people who develop the tests, the people who develop the intelligence tests, are the ones who define what knowledge is. And people from other cultures, from other backgrounds with different life experiences, different from the ones who developed the test, those people will naturally score lower on these tests. And if these scores are believed to reflect a person's capacity, well then, if a group of people tends to do poorly on the test, the results can be taken as evidence that that group of people is inferior. So a key problem with this intelligence testing movement will involve the ways in which people have defined the construct of intelligence. Now, let's bring Charles Davenport back into our story. Recall that Charles Davenport had established a eugenics record office and that Davenport was collecting data from interviews with people on things he thought might be inheritable traits. So, in 1909, Davenport asks Henry Goddard to help collect data on what he called the inheritability of feeble-mindedness. And Goddard agreed to do this, and this led to a major study and to a book that was published in 1912 called The Kallikak Family, a study in the heredity of feeble-mindedness. So Goddard's work began with a woman that he called Deborah Kallikak, and she was a resident at the Vineland Home for the Feeble-Minded, the place where Goddard worked. 
And Goddard provided the following description of her. He said, Deborah is a, quote, high-grade, feeble-minded person, the moron, the delinquent, the kind of girl or woman that fills our reformatories. They are wayward. They get into all sorts of trouble and difficulties sexually and otherwise. And on the screen are pictures of Deborah Kalakak from Goddard's book. So what happened is that Goddard traced the family lineage of Deborah, and he determined that she was a descendant of a soldier named Martin, who lived at the time of the Revolutionary War. Goddard determined that Martin had what he called a, quote, casual intimacy with a feeble-minded barmaid, and this produced a line of defective descendants, eventually leading to Deborah. And Goddard determined that Marson also later, uh, later Martin married a respectable Quaker woman, which produced a very different line of descendants. And Goddard presumed that the barmaid had a gene for feeble-mindedness that was then passed down to all her descendants, and that, that Martin's respectable Quaker wife did not have this gene. So after extensive tracking and interviewing, Goddard reported that he found 480 descendants of that feeble-minded barmaid. And among this group, there were only 46 normal, but there were 143 definitely feeble-minded people, 36 illegitimate births, 33 sexually immoral people, three epileptics, and 24 alcoholics. In contrast, Goddard reported that he found 469 descendants of that respectable Quaker wife, and among this group, Goddard found only three somewhat mentally degenerate people, and in this group he found many doctors, many lawyers, and many judges. The pictures on the screen are from Goddard's book, and they are supposed to be uh, pictures of the descendants from the feeble-minded side of the family. So Goddard's book seemed to provide convincing evidence that intelligence was inherited and that feeble-minded people should not be allowed to have babies. And his Kallikak study was viewed as a standard component of general psychological knowledge for many years. The picture on the screen is a summary of the Kallikak study from a psychology textbook from the 1950s. Now, as you might have guessed, there were several problems with Goddard's research. He reportedly collected all his data in only two years, and it seems impossible to collect that much data in such a short time and to do it well, at least. His research assistants, they had little training, and just like the data that Davenport was collecting at the eugenics records office, they often used unstructured interviews and secondhand information. And, even if Goddard had used good assessment methods, he ignored the environmental influence. He ignored the fact that people born into a privileged family will pass that privilege down to future generations. Also, in line with my comments about the importance of defining intelligence, it is notable that Goddard equated criminal behavior and having children out of wedlock with feeble-mindedness. And regardless of how intelligence is defined, the idea that it could be caused by a single recessive medallion type gene is rather implausible. One of the key concerns of the eugenics movement at this time involved people who were immigrating to the United States from southern and eastern parts of Europe. Recall that Madison Grant wrote his book about how the United States was comprised of people from a superior Nordic race and how there was a danger of the United States being taken over by immigrants who were Alpines and Mediterraneans. Now, at this time, Ellis Island in New York was the primary port of entry for immigrants uh, coming to the United States from Europe. The pictures on the screen are pictures of immigrants uh, being evaluated for entry at Ellis Island. So in 1910, Goddard began a study of evaluating the immigrant screening process at Ellis Island, and he began testing the intelligence of immigrants at Ellis Island. And he tested many immigrants using his version of the Binet intelligence test and also some other tests. And he asked them things like, 
What is Crisco? Who is Christy Mathewson? And another example is an item where they showed them a picture of a tennis court without a net, and they were asked to identify what is missing in this picture. Again, this provides an especially clear example of how knowledge is culturally based. But based on this research, Goddard concluded that most of the immigrants were feeble-minded. Specifically, he concluded that 83% of the Jews, 80% of the Hungarians, 79% of the Italians, and 87% of the Russians were all feeble-minded. And here are some more pictures of Goddard. I believe he's on vacation in these pictures, albeit wearing a bow tie. So what were Goddard's views on eugenics and race? Obviously, he was a supporter of eugenics and he promoted racist ideas. And to get a little more detail on this, note that Goddard believed that equality between people is a myth, and he thought it was futile to try to improve the lot of poor and disadvantaged people. At one point, he proposed a plan that all people should be giving intelligence tests, and then each person should be assigned a particular range of job options based on his or her intelligence. And it might not be surprising, he was a strong supporter of sterilization. At one point, he served on a committee that supported sterilization laws and that recommended that defective classes of people should be eliminated through sterilization. Notably, all the other major figures in this intelligence testing movement were also on the same committee. And by the way, so was Edward Thorndike, and interestingly, so was Alexander Graham Bell. So, given Goddard's negative views of immigrants, it might not be surprising that he also voiced race, racist ideas against black people. Uh, for example, at one point he stated that the average mental age in the United States is about 13, and that the uh, mental age for Negroes are much lower. Notably, later in life, he decided that some of his early work had been misguided. I do not know exactly which ideas he retained and which ideas he thought were misguided, but maybe he became a little wiser with age. But I suspect that even then he probably maintained many racist ideas. The next person that played a major role in the intelligence testing movement is Louis Terman. And like Goddard, Terman also did graduate work with Stanley Hall at Clark University. Terman did a dissertation using mental tests, and in his dissertation he compared what he called seven bright boys with seven stupid boys. Then, after graduating, Terman moved to California because he had tuberculosis and he wanted a warm climate. And in California, he got a job as a principal of a high school, and then he got a job as a professor at Los Angeles Normal School, which is now California State. Uh, note the term normal school is a term that was used at the time to describe a college for teachers. Uh, the picture on the screen is a picture of Turman and his family working in their garden from around this time. So, after working in Los Angeles for a few years, Terman then got a job at Stanford University in 1910. And at this point in time, Stanford was a relatively new school, and they had just recently established a psychology department. So, while Terman was at Stanford in 1916, Terman published a new intelligence test called the Stanford Binet Test. And in contrast to Goddard's test, which was merely a translation of the Binet test, Terman's test was a revision of the Binet test, and Terman collected norms for his test from a large standardization sample. He also calculated scores on his test using a concept called the intelligence quotient, or the IQ. That's where the term IQ comes from. And this was supposed to be a person's mental age divided by his or her chronological age. Notably, the idea of an intelligence quotient is rather problematic because it assumes that mental age is something that is linear, that it progresses over time at a steady rate. So, for example, they might say, well, this child has the mental age of a five-year-old, or this child has the mental age of a nine-year-old. But at some point, this stops making sense. For example, 
if you start talking about someone having the mental age of a 48 year old compared to having the mental age of a 53 year old. I'm not sure what that would mean. Now, when Terman published his intelligence scale, he published information on how that scale was supposed to be used. And by looking at this information, we can get a better perspective on his views of intelligence testing. Now, in general, Terman presumed that intelligence was innate and unchangeable. So in describing how people should use his intelligence scales, he focused on the need to lower expectations for what he called deficient children rather than on finding effective ways of teaching children with special needs. Here's a quote to give you a feel for Terman's approach. He wrote, Instead of wasting energy in the vain attempt to hold mentally slow and defective children up to, up to a level of progress which is normal to the average child, it would be wiser to take account of the inequalities of children in original endowment and to differentiate the course of study in such a way that each child will be allowed to progress at the rate which is normal to him, whether that be rapid or slow. And like Goddard, Terman presumed that intelligence is associated with morality, crime, and delinquency. For example, here's a few other quotes from Terman. For, at one point he writes, uh, There is no investigator who denies the fearful role played by mental deficiency in the production of vice, crime, and delinquency. And another point, Terman writes, it is safe to predict that in the near future, intelligence tests will bring tens of thousands of these high-grade defectives under the surveillance and protection of society. This will ultimately result in curtailing the reproduction of feeble-mindedness and in the elimination of an enormous amount of crime, pauperism, and industrial inefficiency. And he also presumed that intelligence tests could distinguish between abilities acquired by genetic endowment and abilities acquired by education and experience. For example, he writes, only intelligence tests can grade the raw material with which education works, and they can distinguish the results of our educational efforts with a given child from the influence of the child's original endowment. Terman is also famous for doing an extensive study of gifted children. He obtained a sample of over 1,000 children that he determined had IQs over 140, and he followed the accomplishments of these children over time. This study was passed on to other researchers, and eventually participants were followed for over 80 years, which makes this an impressive longitudinal study. The participants in the study became known as Terman's termites. Notably, Terman was often involved in the lives of his termites. He wrote them letters. He had them as guests at his home. He supported them. He wrote them recommendation letters and sometimes offered them scholarships. Of course, this type of involvement in the lives of research participants would be a bad example of how to conduct a longitudinal study. So anyway, let it, let's conclude our discussion of Terman by taking a closer look at his views on race and eugenics. Like all the people in the intelligence testing movement, Terman strongly supported eugenics. And in line with Madison Grant, Terman believed that the Nordic races were superior to other races. At one point, Terman writes about being concerned by calculations he made that would suggest that after 200 years, a group of Nordic Harvard graduates would have only 50 descendants, 
whereas an equal size of group uh, of people from bad races would have about 100,000 descendants. And in this case, Terman defined the bad races as including Mediterranean, Mexican, and African. And so Terman expected intelligence tests to reveal what he called, quote, he thought it would reveal a enormously significant racial differences in general intelligence, differences which cannot be wiped out by any scheme of mental culture. And Terman identified something that he called a general dullness of thought among the, quote, Spanish, Indian, and Mexican families of the Southwest and also among the Negroes. And he claimed that black people have an average mental age that is three years lower than the average white person. So Terman, like many of the people we've been looking at, supported eugenics and had very racist ideas. The third person who played a major role in the intelligence testing movement is Robert Yerkes. So Yerkes studied with Hugo Munsterberg at Harvard, and then afterwards he got a job on the faculty at Harvard. On the screen is a picture of Yerkes at Harvard. I think it was from the time when he was still a graduate student. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Yerkes wrote that summary of Pavlov's work that introduced Pavlov to the United States, and he was a member of the Galton Society. That was the group founded by Grant and Davenport that believed in Nordic race superiority that promoted eugenics and wanted immigration restriction. Now, for most of his life, Yerkes' primary research interest actually involved research with apes. However, at the time of World War I, he got pulled into the intelligence testing movement. So what happened is that Yerkes was elected to be president of the American Psychological Association, or the APA, and while Yerkes was president of the APA is when the United States entered World War I. And so as president, Yerkes, he sought to organize potential psychological contributions to the war. And as part of this, he organized a team of psychologists that included himself and Goddard and Terman and a few others, and they all met together at the Vineland Home for the Feeble-Minded, the place where Goddard worked. The picture on the screen is a picture from this meeting, and you can see Goddard and Terman and Yerkes all in the picture. It looks like maybe they're taking mini picture because I think, I think Goddard's holding a camera, so maybe he's going to take a picture next. So their goal was to make tests that would be useful for the army. So this team spent about two weeks at Vineland making psychological tests that the army could use. So then Yerkes becomes a major in the army and his role is to organize psychological examinations for all the incoming army recruits. And he developed two intelligence tests that were used for this purpose. These tests were called the Army Alpha and the Army Beta. The Alpha was for recruits that could, that could read, and the Beta was for recruits that could not read. On the screen is a picture of a group of Army recruits that are taking one of these intelligence tests. Here are examples of items from the Army Alpha. We have some things where they're supposed to follow directions, some arithmetic problems, practical judgment, if a man made a million dollars, he ought to A, pay off the national debt, B, contribute to various worthy charities, or C, give it all to some poor man. The correct answer there, I guess, is B. Uh, we got uh, disarr disarranged sentences. So we've got leg, flies, one have only. You're supposed to figure out how those words go together to make a sentence, which would be a false sentence. Um, we've got analogies. Gun is to shoot as knife is to run cuts hat or bird or information. The wine dot is a kind of horse, fowl, cattle, or granite. So that's examples of the army alpha. And here, here's the army beta. Here's a few examples from the beta, which would be for people who can't read. So here we got to complete the maze and find your way through the maze. Here we have a sequence of X's and, X's and O's and figure out what comes next in the sequence. This type of uh, coding thing where we have codes before each number, so you're supposed to put the right code below each number there. Here we've got a picture with something's missing, and you're supposed to identify what's missing in that picture. So those are examples of items from the Army Alpha and the Army Beta. <laughs> 
So what were the consequences of this large-scale intelligence testing project with the Army during World War I? Well, the actual contribution to the war effort was probably negligible. The idea was that results from the intelligence tests could be used to place recruits into positions where they were best suited. But military commanders were not inclined to let a few academic intellectuals tell them how to manage things. So within the army, the intelligence testing probably had almost no effect. However, for the discipline of psychology, it made a notable contribution, because it made psychology somewhat famous. Before the war, few people knew what psychology was. But after the war, many people knew what psychology was. They thought, well, psychologists, they're those people that can determine your intelligence. And people became familiar with psychology, both because so many recruits were tested, and also because Yerkes promoted the program and he promoted the results of his program. After the war, he reported that, as a result of his testing, he determined that the average mental age for a white person was only 13 years old, and that half of the white draft recruits were morons. Now, this is somewhat of a nonsensical thing to report, but it caused quite a stir, and it helped make psychology a household word. Now, of course, given that Yerkes was a strong supporter of eugenics and he thought that the Nordic race was superior, it's not surprising that he reported racial differences in intelligence test scores. So whereas he claimed that the average white person had a mental age of only 13, he claimed that the mental age for black people and for recent immigrant groups, he thought their mental age was much lower. And to close out our discussion of the decade of 1910, let's consider what is happening with the new profession of clinical psychology. So after Leitner Whitmer proposed the idea of clinical psychology, a new clinical psychology movement begins to grow. But Whitmer's particular model of clinical psychology begins to fade. And Whitmer becomes engrossed in establishing a school for children with special needs and he seems to drop out of the growing clinical psychology movement. And this new clinical psychology movement quickly becomes engulfed with the intelligence testing movement. And intelligence testing becomes a dominant focus within the new clinical psychology. So clinical psychologists become primarily people who administer tests, and especially intelligence tests. This means that in its early years, clinical psychology was closely tied to a movement associated with eugenics and racism. Notably, in 1917, the clinical psychology movement had grown to the point where it was large enough to have its own new professional organization. So, in 1917, the American Association of Clinical Psychologists was formed. And to illustrate the extent to which this new clinical psychology had become engulfed by the intelligence testing movement, it's notable that the first members of this new clinical psychology organization, they included Cotter and Terman and Yerkes, but Whitmer was not a member of the new organization. Now, this growing clinical psychology movement actually made the psychiatrists rather nervous. Psychiatrists are the medical doctors that treat people with mental disorders, and they were worried that this new profession of clinical psychology might encroach onto their territory. So the psychiatrist published an official response that clarified what they saw as the appropriate role for a clinical psychologist. Specifically, the psychiatrist specified that it was appropriate for psychologists to develop and administer tests, but only psychiatrists should be allowed to interpret the results of a test. Now, eventually, clinical psychologists would encroach into the territory of psychiatry, and eventually clinical psychologists will not only interpret the results of tests, but do a whole lot more. But that's still a ways off in our story. For now, the important thing to note is this. In this, in this decade of 1910, clinical psychologists primarily did intelligence testing. Mm -hmm.